Hi guys, welcome back to Wildebeard Reviews, and welcome back to the Rewind Review Series here on the channel where we're talking about Mutant Massacre. Today we are on to, I think, part 5? I can't remember how many of these videos we've made so far. Regardless, we are working on this series, and today we're on to New Mutants, issue 46, and Uncanny X-Men 212. So, we are picking up in New Mutants, issue 46, from where Ileana Rasputin Magic left um, the storyline in Uncanny X-Men 211. Um, uh, she transported some of the, uh, the main X-Men team into the Morlock Tunnels while the Mutant Massacre was going on. Storm ordered to her to transport some of the wounded back to the mansion, and that's where mutant, uh, where um, new mutants here picks up with them showing up in the mansion, and then Ileana also transporting off to um, Muir Island to pick up Moira, and then Storm and the rest of the X Men show up in this issue, bringing in more wounded and just generally dealing with the fallout there. I'd say about 65-70% of this issue is directly dealing with new mutant stuff, and and then it deals with a little bit, uh, or I'm sorry, Mutant Massacre stuff, and then it deals with um, some New Mutants specific stuff, so we'll cover most of this issue, and then issue 212 is after Storm and the others have gone to the um, X-Men's mansion to deal with the wounded and left uh, uh, Wolverine here in the Morlock Tunnels to hunt down some Marauders, so we see him doing that, and then we also have Storm kind of having a crisis of conscience and a crisis of uh, confidence in herself as a leader of the X-Men in this issue. So let's go ahead and dive into this stuff, kicking off with New Mutants issue 46. All right, so this one is written by Chris Claremont with art by Jackson Goosh. Uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. It's like juice, but with the G. My sincere apologies for not knowing how to pronounce that. So I really love the, the narration that opens up here. It's Bloody Sunday starring the new mutants, and we hear a scream roar out from, from the mansion. It says, Professor Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters, home of the uncanny X-Men and the new mutants. The X-Men are in New York. 40 miles to uh, to the south and to answering the frantic call for help from the Morlocks. Mutants uh, mutants as are Xavier students um, who've uh, chosen to shun mainstream society and establish one of their own in a labyrinthine network, uh, tunnel network beneath the city. As usual the school's novice team has been left behind, away from the action out of danger, but as they're about to discover, nowhere on earth may be safe for mutants anymore. So uh, that scream that we heard was um, Lockheed absolutely flipping out for some reason, and he actually tore through a wall and ran down into um, like the the stuff that's under the mansion, like all the X Men home base and everything like that. And so um, the the new mutants are running down there to check, but Danny Moonstar runs outside. The, the narration here says. Um, uh, as Mirage, Danny Moonstar possesses the, the psychic ability to manifest real as life representations of others' thoughts and emotions. Recently, however, the young Cheyenne uh, also gained the, the power of the fabled Asgardian Valkyrie to see uh, the shape of death over who uh, who are uh, those who are about to die. And then look at this just single page, nearly textless. Just got two bubbles there and then a narration box up there. Look at that amazing artwork the representation of death she can see death coming to the mansion and it is coming it coming in hard but i just love this artwork it just in one single page shows you how horrific what is going on really is she's down here screaming no great spirit have mercy no just and it's not death hanging over a single person it's death hanging over the entire mansion and in one of the um early issues I think it was X Factor 9 that was kind of served as a prelude. Um, uh, Destiny, who was working with Freedom, Fo Freedom Force and um, Mystique and all that, she's like, we need to get out of the tunnels. I see death coming so we have the precog seeing it we have the person who can sense death coming saying oh shit some stuff's about to go wrong and i just i love this page um for for showing that 
And so then here we go to uh, the sleepy island of of Muir Island, and then uh, Moira is just you know chilling, taking a shower. She says here, um, three thousand miles away into the north, off the coast of the Scotland lies Muir Isle, home of Moira McTaggart's Mutant Research Center and a secret adjunct to Xavier School. The middle of the night in New York, uh, it is barely a dawn here. Moira has been up better the better part of an hour, forcing herself through her daily regimen of exercises. It keeps her fit. But uh, some mornings, the gain is hardly worth the pain. And she's just taking a shower to herself. And that's when Ileana shows up and and just yanks her right out of the shower, she says. Uh, she, uh, she says, Banshee's still asleep, Dr. Mintaggart. I left him a note. And she's like, Ileana Rasputin, what the devil? And she says, well, I left him a note to tell him where we go. And then the narration says, and with a blinding flash, magic teleports the pair of them from Earth right into limbo. How about that? You're just... Just, you know, trying to cool off after your morning exercise routine in your shower, just trying to get ready for the day, and boom, a young mutant shows up and transports your naked, wet ass to, to limbo. That'll wake you up in the morning. You won't need coffee <laughs> that morning. You can see her. She's just sitting naked, trying to cover up like the hell is going on magic she says explain yourself girl why have you brought me to this awful awful place uh, it's so damn funny it's it's a little bit of, of humor to um to break the tension that, that or actually to ease you into the tension uh that's coming uh the narration here says transports them to limbo the arcane realm where her demon sorcery rules supreme the tele uh, the teleportation power uh, power enables her to uh travel effortlessly though sometimes uncontrollably through time and space it's what makes her a mutant and it's that uncontrollable piece and time piece that means they have to chill out in limbo uh, for a little bit because she acts jumped back in time um, a little bit. <clears throat> Iliani here says, um, uh, blast and spit, we're stuck, blast and spit, wow, that's, that's, that's funny, um, uh, the blast and spit is your curse words, um, I must have shifted back in time, uh, as well as space, I can't return to, uh, the mansion until I've left it, my scrying pool will show us what's going on, uh, what's happening right now at the mansion, see for yourself, um, is, seeing for yourself is better than me telling you, uh, I don't mean to frighten you, doctor, or I, do I frighten you, doctor, I don't mean to, but I can't help it. I am what I am because Belasco made me and that's not very nice. I'm sorry I snatched you out of the shower and then she conjures her up some clothes and of course it's like some like punk rock biker jacket which is just also hilarious. And so once um, time finally catches up with them we see the rest of the uh, the uncanny X-Men there show up. We've got Kitty who is still phased, uh, phased permanently. Actually I don't think throughout the end of Mutant Massacre she has gotten that fixed. Um, Storm, Rogue, Callisto in the back there, Colossus, and then Sunder, and they're all trying to bring in um, some Morlocks there. And they're all wounded. So Ileana and Moira finally catch up. And then they um, they transport in. Um, Ileana says, Your wish, big brother, is as my command. I saw this on the um, mansion security monitors, Dr. Moira McTaggart. That's why I left to get you. And now that I've gone, it's safe for me to return without rupturing the time stream. Yes, please don't rupture the time stream. We very much need that um, intact. Only, only Barry Allen is allowed to jack up the time stream as much as he does. And we hate him for it. Um, so the, the narration says, As they arrive, startling everyone present, so too do others from the main house, including the school's headmaster, Magneto. Moira says, we'll have to treat this as a combat situation. We'll establish our aid station here in the hangar. So they're basically going to set up like a mobile. Um, you ever watch MASH, a mobile army surgical hospital? So that's basically what they have to, to set up at the at the mansion, like a triage center, like an emergency medical triage center, trying to, um, you know, to help all of these wounded Morlocks and even their own um, wounded X-Men. I forgot to call out um, Nightcrawler right here. He is down for the count, and so is uh, Colossus. We haven't um, seen that yet. I think that's over in Uncanny 12, which we'll get to um, here in a minute. So, um, Storm... Um 
um, reads everyone in on, on what's going on. She says, It was a massacre. A band of super-powered assassins calling themselves the Marauders invaded the Morlock Tunnels, killing everyone they met. It was uh, There was uh, nothing less than a, a planned, a dib- deliberate attempt to wipe out Callisto's people. And for the most part, they succeeded. Among the X-Men, Shadowcat and Nightcrawler are the most critical casualties. And so they're just trying to figure out what's happening um, here. And then I love the uh, this narrative narration here it says hours slip by night uh, to morning to dusk no one notices there's too much to do so it's been like a whole another day and they're just down there trying to help out putting together um bed frames and everything just everyone strewn around uh just trying to help you've got um sunspot here bending metal to make uh equipment uh cannonball ran out to a pharmacy to get medicine um Rogue and uh, Amara here um, are uh, Magma are trying to um, basically weld together new equipment for them as they're going. Uh, just everyone, like all hands on deck, everyone needs to be here um, uh, to help. But it's definitely taking its toll. Sunspot here is lifting this massive uh, bio bed, but his powers are um, are, are waning. Actually, uh, I skipped this uh, back on this other page just to show how affected they are. Um, it says here, um, cubicles are needed, so Spons- Sunspot uses his solar-powered strength to improvise them. He does not realize it, but the young Brazilian has been crying since this horror uh, began, which is just, that's saying something, because I believe Sunspot is usually the one that is full of bravado that you know even in a tense situation he would um you know fake it until he could get somewhere to, to probably be alone to to really feel that emotion and if he's standing there um crying without even realizing it you know how bad the situation is So he's losing his power because he hasn't been outside in a while, and he actually says here, um, uh, my strength that's fading, it derives from sunlight, and it's it's been so long since I've recharged recharged myself, I'm losing my power when I need it most almost drops the bio bath. Luckily, Colossus is there um, to catch it, but he gets ripped a new one by Magneto, perhaps a little bit um, unfairly. He says, Da Costa, um, had that module been damaged, uh, your, your carelessness would have cost lives. And he says, you can't be of use, boy. Stay out of the way of those who can. Kite Cannonball steps up and says, uh, aren't you a little hard on him, sir? Magneto says, look around, you cannibal. Under the circumstances, I have neither the time nor patience to salve a child's wounded pride. Which, I can understand Magneto's point there. Everything they've been dealing with for probably the last roughly 24 hours at this point. Plus, as Magneto, he's kind of an ass to begin with. So, it uh, it makes sense. And we'll see how this affects um, Roberto here in a minute. But, here we get to one of the most... Sad, sad, and impactful moments in this. So Sunder, um, uh, the big guy right here, needs medical attention, and he won't let anyone help him. He's smacking everyone away, saying, "I won't let you. Don't touch me. Don't come near you. I'll bust you up bad." Uh, Magneto is saying, uh, "Sunder, stop." And um, he tries to wrap him up in some uh, in some metal there just to calm him down, just to pin him down, but it doesn't hold. And you can see what um, Moira right here says. She says, if I don't amputate now, he'll bleed to death. Sunder's too upset and his system far too weak for me to risk calming him with drugs. Karma possess him. So Karma is trying to possess his mind to calm him down. The narration says, um, the young Vietnamese uses her special side talent to take control of Sunder's mind, but the Morlock's pain is too raw, smashing past her side shields the moment her thoughts interface with his. So she tries and she just, it, it's too much for even her to take and that's when and Psylocke jumps in. She says, it's more than she can bear. Cut loose karma, withdrawal, let him go. I'll handle this. Then the, the narration here says, and Betsy Braddock, who, is, who as Psylocke is the newest arrival at Xavier's, uses part of her formidable telepathic ability to soothe karma while simultaneously blanking Sunder's mind, um, absorbing the totality of his pain. Wow, so just in this one page, we have a number of things going on um, that I really love from these characters. So Karma just jumps right in, tries to take the pain uh, from Sunder that he's currently feeling and will be feeling um, as his body gets an appendage amputated and when she gets blasted not only does Psylocke jump in to take away Sunder's pain she also soothes Karma so she's like splitting her mind between these two 
I would say, impossible task. I would say, you know, karma is going to be a little bit easier um, to soothe than what's going on with, with Sunder, but she's able to do both. She takes what they describe as the totality of his pain, blanking his mind. That's incredible, and it shows the the empathy of both Karma and Psylocke in this situation, and just the raw power of Psylocke to be able to do both of those things simultaneously. Really, really cool. This is probably the most impactful page um, in this entire comic, and it just it shows yet again how awful this mutant massacre um storyline is well it's a great storyline but the, sh the sheer tragedy and viciousness of of what's going on so they finally um get him down uh, magneto asks psylocke or like can you take the strain and she says i've endured worse headmaster just let me be i can handle it so um the some of the the, the new mutants there wander off to go find uh danny who is literally cowering in a corner because that spirit of death is just wearing on her she says here so many screams so many in need so many dying everywhere i turn as a valkyrie i've got the power to fight death drive him away uh if i've the, the strength the courage i want to save all these poor people but death is too strong i'm only a girl what can i do uh i was a fool to think myself uh, a match for the reaper so she should be able as a valkyrie as she's saying as she is saying here should be able to fight off death but there is just so much death it is so insane right there there's so much going on that she can't even control it and all she can do is you know curl up into the fetal position in a corner and try to deal with it and then luckily cannonball um comes along just to help soothe her she asks um he asks her if you're okay and she says there's no hope and she says for the morlocks or um or the new mutants just man just a good couple pages there showing um just the viciousness of of what's going on and then here we catch up with um with roberto or uh, sunspot as he's going upstairs still fuming um from what's going on while ryan is uh, Rain is putting together sandwiches and food uh, for everyone downstairs, but Roberto uh, goes to grab a sandwich um, just because he's hungry. You know, you see sandwich, you're hungry, you see sandwiches, you grab one, and then um, uh, Rain smacks his hand and he flips out, smacks the, uh, kicks the table over, smashes it, and then basically all of the new mutants. <clears throat> start yelling at each other they're falling apart they can't take the strain so it just shows um these younger team members just how hard it is on them as they're trying to deal with all of this um so this is where he um kicks the table over rain here says um you uncaring uh sapien uh, i'm sick of you always thinking of yourself uh the, it's time past time someone taught you a lesson um <clears throat> Danny's um and Danny and uh Wolfsbane's um telepathic link kicks up as soon as she uh transforms so that's what calls him in there and they see them fighting um down here and I love some of this uh this dialogue up here um uh, Danny says, shut up, the pair of you, how dare you behave like this? No wonder we'll ca we're called ex-babies. People are hurt and dying downstairs, and all you can do is pick up some stupid scrap. Um, thanks a whole heck of a lot. Uh, some help you are. Um, <clears throat> Rain just kind of apologizes. Sons or, uh, Cannonball says, um, easy to say, Rain. Um, and that's when uh, Sunspot says, I wanted to help Danny more than anything, but Magneto wouldn't let me. The new mutants have proven our worth time and time again. Only uh, only uh, everyone keeps treating us like kids. And that's when Danny says, maybe Bobby, because some of us insist on acting the part. Damn, Danny dropping the leadership right there. Love that line. Uh, Cannonball says, uh, doing something big or small in public and or private ain't important, Bobby. It's the helping that matters. Come on, how about we put this mess to right and then make a new batch of sandwiches? Uh, the folks downstairs could probably use them. But again, I just, I love these pages because you can see how it's having an effect on these characters. This is where these books get real and raw and down to the character level. Yeah, we can fight, you know, and have big splash she fights that tear up uh, New York and whatever and all that and that's all well and good but when you get down to with a character level like this when you kind of put them in the shit like um <clears throat> 
like this story has been, you can kind of really um, amplify these characters and develop them and see where they are at this point. It's really, really cool stuff. Uh, so down here, we're starting to get into where the new mutants specific storyline is taking us. Um, uh, Warlock is outside um, running some scans on some stuff. Doug Ramsey goes out to check on him and just kind of gets um, shuffled off a little bit. Um, also over here, um, Karma is calling her, um, her uh, I think her mother and her sister. Sister, yeah, says, uh, says, uh, uh, why aren't you there? And then um, she hangs up the phone, and Matt and Ileana says, well, let's go check on him. She said, uh, Karma says, um, I know how little you are. Uh, I'm sick of uh, worry about my brother and sister. Sorry, I said mother and sister. It's her uh, brother and sister. Uh, they left the school hours ago, and so uh, Magic teleports her off so they can go check on them. And it doesn't exactly go well. They get to the apartment, they walk in, they turn on the light switch. And it explodes, which is, you know, it, it, that doesn't normally happen. That's not supposed to happen. Um, so again, just some more New Mutants specific storylines there. Um, the New Mutants kind of... Um, gather up trying to figure out where they went they go down into the tunnels morlock or um warlock sorry M morlock warlock warlock turns himself into a car um so they can um uh, drive through the tunnels to um come out in the city where uh, magic and karma just went but we also got this down here magus i think it's the father of warlock if i did my research correctly which sometimes i do sometimes i don't sorry about that so he has um um, come to Earth, and then um, they get out. Um, the the mutants get out there. Um, they see the run, the burnt down building or the explosion, and then the fire brigade is there. And that's when Warlock starts flipping out, and they have to um, fight his dad. I, I fight his dad or fight uh, Magus, and then that's where it ends. And then we'll you know carry off into the next issue of New Mutants. But um, like I said, about sixty five, maybe maybe even sixty percent of this issue is. Um, specific to um, the Mutant Massacre storyline with the rest kind of setting up or continuing existing new mutants storylines. Um, but the stuff that is in here for Mutant Massacre is incredible. That um, that amputation scene, the scene with um, basically them all just working through the night to the point where they tire themselves out and then just the whole scene in the kitchen. I really, really enjoy that. So that is New Mutants 46 I'm going to take a break and get some water, and then we're going to talk about Uncanny X-Men issue 212. All right, so moving on here, we get to Uncanny X-Men 212. Now, there's really kind of three big things going on in this issue. One is Wolverine running around in the Morlock Tunnels, hunting down the Marauders where he runs into Sabretooth, and we get some great Wolverine versus Sabretooth stuff. Then back at the mansion, we've got um, everyone trying to uh, medically care for all of the injured X-Men and the injured uh, Morlocks there, and uh, Colossus goes down hard uh, and then we have a storm having a crisis of uh, confidence um, losing confidence in herself as the leader of both the Morlocks and the X-Men which is entirely fitting for what's going on with this and Callisto has to be the one to talk her down so lots of lots of great stuff going on in this one but we start off here with Wolverine and I love this opening narration it says a mile beneath Manhattan are the tunnels where the Morlocks lived until the Marauders killed them. Now, I know that that was written completely seriously back in uh, December of 1986, but with the way that uh, kind of the meta humor has gone uh, between the last 34 years, I can't help but read that in a humorous way. They lived there until they were killed which it's i know it's taking a it's kind of cutting the story off at the knees but i just thought it was it was hilarious um uh, i forgot to mention written by chris claremont with art by rick leonardi and rick leonardi is actually still doing comics uh to this day in this past few months i think he's done some uh batman beyond and nightwing at least within the last year so it's cool to see um uh, rick still kicking around uh, the narration continues and says wolverine moves silently through through the carnage, alert for the slightest sounds, the smallest movement, the the faintest scent of life. Violence is in his nature. Murder is not. That he means to find those uh, those responsible and pay them back in 
full measure. And so we see him just running around in uh, the Morlite tunnels there, checking all the bodies, runs into some rats, scares them off, thinking that they're, you know, they're there to eat the bodies, he says here. Um, uh, wasted effort scaring them away. They're just doing what comes naturally. Soon as I'm gone, uh, they'll be back. Too many bodies with no one, no place, no time to bury them. And that's actually not going to be a concern by the end of this issue, because the end of this issue actually coincides with the blast, the energy blast that Thor lets out at the end of Thor issue 374. We'll see that at the end here, and I'll um, it, it, you'll see it on the um, on the uh, reading order flowchart that I'm, I'm working on once it's all uh, said and done. So here we have Psylocke reaching out to him and uh, passing along a message from Storm. She says, um, uh, Storm wants a prisoner for interrogation. That's what's vitally important. Uh, Wolverine says, I'll get her one, but one's all she's going to get because the rest are mine. And then he also says here, um, or she says she understands, and uh, he tells Psylocke, a high-class babe, babe like you, that'll be the day." stumbled across some uh, friends of the X-Men uh, kid group called Power Pack, but I shooed them safely home. And actually, there's an editor note here. It says issue 29, but it's actually issue 27. So yeah, that's a uh, comic we'll go over in the next installment of this series, uh, Power Pack issue 27, where they go down into the sewers because um, Franklin Richards gets a, um, a vision from Artie, I think, uh, or Leech, one of those two in that issue. And they, the Power Pack runs down into the sewers where they run into both uh, Wolf Wolverine and X-Factor, and they also fight Sabretooth and the Morlocks. It's a pretty action-packed issue for Power Pack. <laughs> anyway, so Psylocke uh, psychically hangs up there with Wolverine as he continues on um, into the, the sewers. He says, uh, Storm's tough, she'll do fine. I gotta go, girl. Work to do, I will be in touch. And then that's where we go to the mansion where Psylocke is there using Cerebro to reach out to uh, Wolverine. And then we go to the, the medical bay down underneath. And they say, uh, 30 meters below Betsy, the wounded are being cared for by Magneto, the school's headmaster, the, the staff, uh, the medical staff, Dr. Moira McTaggart and her nurse Sharon, uh, Callista, who led the Morlocks until she was supplanted by Storm, uh, who's also the X-Men's current leader, and they have to unfortunately declare uh, that Morlock there dead on the table because they just can't, um, can't save her. Or save him. Um, and then they're saying here, um, all right, Sharon, let's cover him up and clear him out. We need the space. Uh, Sharon says they're losing so many. Magneto says that's what happens in a war. Sharon says we're not equipped to handle this, Magneto. These people should be in a hospital. And that's when Callisto goes off. She says, we're muties, uh, Sharon. What hospital would take us? Uh, how many normal people would risk their lives to protect us when the marauders show up to finish the job? We're outcasts. The Morlocks had no place in surface society. Uh, we went uh, underground. We made the deep tunnels our home because there we thought we'd be happy and safe. We should have known better. And man, that is that's rough. Um, I was actually um, in season two of Umbrella Academy. There's a scene. Uh, so if you don't know, season two of Umbrella Academy takes place almost exclusively in 1963 um, Dallas, Texas, um, kind of leading up to the, the Kennedy assassination. And it's also the height of the, the Civil War or not the Civil War, the Civil rights movement and um, uh, one of the characters is trying to call the hospital to get um, uh, Rumor um, I can't remember her real name, Allison Rumor or Allison is trying to call the hospital to get her husband um, uh, medical attention and they say they won't treat him because he's African American so just another um, parallel here between what the mutants are talking about and that continued allegory between um, the X-Men and real life um, civil rights uh, movements um, throughout history so just thought I'd uh, throw that out there. Uh, this is when Storm starts to break down in her own confidence. She says the X-Men are, or she's thinking to herself, the X-Men are a little different. We stand as humanity's defenders. Uh, we too feel forced to hide behind the facade of Xavier schools. Look at me, Nightcrawler. Say a word, please. Smile. I need to hear your laughter as Nightcrawler is just sitting there um, uh, or laying there unconscious uh, on the bed. 
They go over and check on Shadow Cat. She's still permanently stuck in that phased um, state. And then um, Wolverine, or I'm sorry, Colossus is talking about like the the Marauders. He says, "Who were those butchers, Storm? Why did they do this?" Uh, I live for the moment. Wolverine finds out uh, to find them, crush them as I did. Uh, the uh, Riptide, the one who struck down a Nightcrawler, because he actually did kill Riptide in one of those earlier issues. Storm's here looking at her reflection, and it's not a pretty reflection. She uh, thinks to herself, Peter was the gentlest of souls, yet now he dreams of vengeance, who swore, uh, and I who swore never to kill, led the X-Men to this. And she screams, Bright Lady, what have I, what have I done? As she runs out into the stormy night and just literally jumps off a cliff into a lake. She can't handle it anymore. Um, the narration here says, Colossus assures Callisto that he is fine, uh, but she doesn't want to believe him. Col uh, Colossus wants to go chase after Storm. Uh, no one, X-Men or Morlock, emerged from the massacre unscathed. Some wounds are physical, others are spiritual, no less cruel, no less moral. Aurora runs without thought or direction, a madness, a need to escape uh, that will not be denied, and she jumps off there. Uh, once she flew, the weather ha uh, was hers to command, but those days are long gone. Yet she... Uh, uh, believed herself best qualified to shepherd the X-Men, her confidence then blind arrogance today. So just, she is just taking it absolutely so hard because she's both the leader of the X-Men and the Morlocks, and the Morlocks are just devastated. The X-Men have been, you know, rocked as hard as they maybe have ever been um, up until this point. Maybe even only the Phoenix Saga or something like that can, can match this, at least in my immediate recollection. Uh, but she's just, she is, is in, in a crisis she's having a breakdown because of of what's going on Colossus goes to um, go see Psylocke so he can um, try and get her to find Storm, but then he immediately collapses, crushing Psylocke, which is, again, it's not really supposed to be funny, but it's it's kind of funny. Uh, Stor or, uh, Rogue and Mr., um, who is this? I forgot his name. Uh, Mr. Corsi, a character I'm not really familiar with, her standing guard um, down in the basement at the entrance to the Morlock Tunnels when Psylocke calls out to Rogue, basically screaming, hey, come get Colossus off me because he's in metal form and weighs like two tons, right? So she uh, runs off there um, and tries to and lifts Colossus off of uh, off of Psylocke and then uh, Callisto is tending to Psylocke and she's like, eh, you probably broke a couple ribs there, not too big a deal. And then Psylocke's like, how very reassuring. So yeah, uh, Psy Colossus is wounded a lot more than he let anyone uh, know. Um, here we go back to uh, Wolverine running down through the tunnels and he's trying to sniff out um, uh, different uh, paths and or um, tracks and everything like that. He actually uh, smells the original X-Men. He calls them out here, Cyclops, Angel, Iceman, Beast. He's like, they were the original X-Men, so how come they're part of this X-Factor uh, outfit whose job is hunting mutants? Because they still don't know that the, uh, the X-Factor is, you know, doing what they're doing. But then he also smells Gene. He's like, oh, a female scent that I would know anywhere. But that's when good old Sabretooth slashes him across the back. We'll jump back to, uh, to him in a minute. We go back to Storm. Uh, she's hiding from Rogue. She says here, uh, silence, silence, not a whisper, not a breath. She will hear my heart uh, f uh, pounding fit to burst. She will hear, go away, Rogue. Just go away. Let me be. And then she just rips her clothes and just runs off into uh, into the um, into the forest there, into the trees. Just leave me alone. Let me be. I can't even, like, ripping her own clothes off. Like, I don't even know what is going on with me right now. But then we go back to Colossus, who is just effed up. He, he collapses and they don't know how to fix him. Um, um, Moira's up here is like, I can't help him. I don't have medicines or any tools that can get through him in his metal form. But then, very interestingly, Magneto steps in. I love, love this moment from Magneto. He says, you forget Dr. Um, Steel, even in Colossus's organic variety is a ferrous compound and as such susceptible to my magnetic powers. First, we must ascertain the nature and severity of Peter's injuries. So he basically sits down and is going to fix Colossus's metal body. He like scans his entire body and fixes 
everything that's going on inside of him, which is a really, really cool idea. I never, you know, we always think about, you know, Magneto being able to do things with um, Wolverine because of the adamantium, but I never really thought about Colossus being able to be manipulated that same way by by Magneto. But here, he literally reaches inside his body and, and heals everything um, that's going on inside him. He says here, he draws strength, or Magneto draws strength uh, from Earth's magnetic field until he is filled to overflowing simultaneously refi uh, refining his perception until he can make out the shape and structure of every molecule every um, individual atom of Colossus's body uh, when he is ready uh, he uh, he up within him uh, he releases the energy pent up within him letting it flow like a gentle wave through the young Russian uh, pausing at each uh, locus of disruption to restore the broken pattern realign the bionic matrices his power uh, uh, and inoperable in uh, as in inexorable as the ocean until all the damage is swept away fixes Colossus down to the molecule that is such a cool thing from Magneto he actually um says here I think it's on this page he says um uh yeah um, the, the strain is awful. He has taken so much life, brought harm so easily, it became almost second nature. Now, he has a chance to heal. Oh, I love I love that characterization uh, from, from Magneto. So, Colossus wakes up, but he's still, like, frozen. He, he can't move, and I think we come back to him um, here in a minute. Back down to the tunnels. We got Wolverine. We got Sabretooth. They're going to throw down, but Sabretooth has a Morlock here. He's about to kill. Wolverine recognizes him um, as a healer, and then they just start going at each other, just like you know you would expect Wolverine and and Sabretooth to do. Love this kind of older style. I, I guess it's the style at the time. It's a 34 year old comic book. Love this uh, costume style on on Sabretooth there. Um, Wolverine says, talk is cheap, bub, show me, and he pops claws, and they start fighting there, um, great stuff, uh, Callisto and Rogue are out there looking for, uh, Storm, who's found some new clothes that she stole off of a line here, um, and she says, uh, uh Callisto is saying, Aurora won the Morlock, uh, leadership away from me, um, uh, by, be a real kick tonight if I took the X-Men away from her, um, Rogue up here hands Callisto back the black vest, and Callisto Callisto says the vest's a badge of her office. I wore one like it, and so she's going to basically try and foist this um, vest back on um, Storm and try and rest, uh, restore her confidence in herself. So we see these two pages here with them fighting. Storm says, let me go, Callisto, let me go. I've suffered enough. Callisto says, not hardly. Uh, you feel this way, uh, and then why'd you take the job in the first place? Storm says, I thought I was needed. Who knows, perhaps I still am as a great digger and Callisto's not having it. She says, "Poor baby, you figure uh, you figure the only one who's had it rough. Guess again, Wind Rider. Open your eyes. We've all been hurt, and things will probably get a whole lot worse before it's over. Life for Morlocks and X Men both will never be the same. But uh, the um, but and why? Uh, but no way will I abandon the ones who are left." Storm says, I, can, I can't I can give any more. Please, I have nothing left. She says, uh, they're my people, like the X-Men are yours. They put their trust in us. That makes us obligated uh, to, uh, uh, to be true to them in return, no matter what. It's like, you took on that leadership. You physically fought me for leadership, and you are going to go lead them. I don't give a shit how hard it is. You're going to go back over there. You're going to put this vest on, and you're going to step up, and you're going to lead these people. You took them away from me, and now you go take care of your responsibility oh it's so so good um callisto says you can run aurora uh, you can run from me but what about yourself uh she screams leave me alone she says make me uh, it's like um callisto says you lost the privilege same as i did the day you donned that vest like you don't have the privilege of running away you have a responsibility to these people you're going to um to go back and take and take up your mantle oh so, so good. Uh, more Wolverine versus um, uh, uh, Sabretooth here. They're basically just doing a standard Wolverine versus Sabretooth fight. Um, John at each other during the fight, and it's pretty good. Actually, there's something I, I missed. Um, I'm trying. I'm going a little faster than I, I would like. Let me scoot back here because um, there's something I missed. Um, it is 
this right here, Sabretooth says, Mr. Sinister's dealing a game that don't allow for wild cards like the Morlocks or X chumps like you either. I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe that, that is the first mention of Mr. Sinister maybe ever because his first appearance isn't until issue I think 221 which is nine issues away from from where we are in this one so I think that's the first time we've mentioned Mr. Sinister at least in in Mutant Massacre there might have been a couple issues before this where um, Mr. Sinister was mentioned but we actually don't see him for another nine issues which I think is really interesting so they keep fighting. Wolverine buries Sabretooth under some bricks so he can save the Morlock and get him out of there. Uh, live to fight another day. And fight they do because there's two more issues with Sabretooth as a focal point there. And so Sab uh, Wolverine picks up that the Morlock and, and takes him home. And here we go, the finishing up with Storm and Callisto. Uh, Callisto says, you um, you have no right to not lead. Uh, you punk out. If you wrap it, what's to say, um, uh, what's that say to Colossus and Nightcrawler and Shadowcat, the ones who died and the ones who are still hanging on, the X-Men. If the dream they and Xavier's school embody aren't worth fighting for, why the blazes should they shed the their blood it's a debt that can't be welched on oh it's like these people died and now you want to walk away nope that is not how it's going to be storm says why do you care about them uh why do you care about me i thought you would be happy to see me fall and take my place and Callisto says well me too life's full of surprises don't fret though we're still rivals and someday uh to take back the leadership of the morlocks i may well kill you but i've come to respect you aurora and i mean to see you worthy of that respect and of yourself and gets her to put the, the vest back on and retake up that leadership oh I love it. All right, so Wolverine is bringing that um, that Morlock back to the tunnels, and um, the that's when the blast re uh, roils through. You can see it right here. Uh, Rogue jumps down in there to pull them out of the fire, and then that's where we end this one off. So, guys, another uh, couple of fantastic issues in the Mutant Massacre storyline. I know this was a, a bit of a longer video than uh, we've been doing on these. They're probably about a... 45 minute video when it's all said and done so if you guys have gotten to this point in the video do me a favor hit me with a bangerang down in the comments down below that would be much appreciated be also appreciative uh, or appreciate the fact if you guys would hit that subscribe button if you're not already uh, subscribed uh, that would mean a lot to me it definitely would um, also if you want to support the channel in the description box there are a few ways of doing that um, I'll wrap this up quick guys thank you so much for watching I love this series hopefully you're enjoying it too probably two more videos in this series thank you guys for watching until next time we'll see you at the comic shop